Hi, everybody. Welcome to a program proudly sponsored by the Western Gallery up at Western Washington University. My name is Tammy Landis, and I am the museum educator at the Western Gallery. And we have a great exhibition going on. And obviously, with this pandemic, we've had to cancel some of our programs. But I'm so excited to bring you one part of our perspective series today with the, the wonderful Dr. Vernon Damani Johnson. I'm gonna give you a little bit of information first about this exhibition and our series, and then I'm gonna introduce our guest speaker. And then he's gonna dive into one of the series in Bennett, Knowledge Bennett's um, pieces, series in this exhibition, and we're gonna learn a wealth of information. So I'm really excited for you to join us today, and it's a pleasure to be able to share this information and to bring our exhibition to your home to your space through continued programming online. So the Perspective Series at the Western Gallery brings together scholars from a range of backgrounds and interests to lead informal 45-minute discussions of topics conjured by the art installations, typically in the gallery. But like I mentioned, today's a little bit different. We're doing this as a recording. So this will be about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and this perspective series is a part of our exhibition, Knowledge Bennett Road to Damascus. Knowledge Bennett's work that's on display here, this is a retrospective. So this is a survey of recent work by the artist. This is work that he's been creating since 2012 to today. And he's a LA based artist and gallery owner. And his work is heavily influenced by um, the nature of pop art. So you're going to see a lot of influences here, especially to Andy Warhol and some other pop icons in the world. Um, so here's just a little bit of an overview of what you would see if you were joining us today in the gallery. Um, so each of these works that you're seeing come from different moments in, in Knowledge's development as an artist. And all really significant. I mean, he's using really bold dynamic Im imagery, meaning through people, through portraits, or even colors. Um, so there's some really significant work here. And please do watch some of the other videos that we've created of virtual tours to learn a bit more about this work. And the work that we're going to be talking about today, um, that Dr. Damani Johnson is going to be, you know, really diving into with us, this is called Orange is the New Black. And this series was probably one of the first controversial political work series that knowledge took a stance to really use the platform of art to have a voice to speak up for untold historical injustices. And this is probably his most important body of work. So we're really pleased to bring in the perspectives of Dr. Vernon Damani Johnson. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Johnson, and then we're going to dive right into this conversation. So our esteemed guest today, <laughs> who I am so thankful is participating in this, Dr. Vernon Damani Johnson, has been a faculty member in the Department of Political Science at Western Washington University since 1986. His research interests include the politics of development, African politics, and race and public policy. In addition to teaching courses on the politics of Africa, race and public policy, Dr. Johnson leads a summer service learning class in South Africa that involves Western students in political science and human services and rehabilitation in the work of local NGOs. He currently serves as the program director for the Monroe Institute for Civic Education and is the editor in chief of the African Journal of Governance and Develop Development. And personally, he is a great friend. He is a pleasure to be around, has a wealth of knowledge. Just our conversations in the gallery continue to be deep and personal and so inviting. And I'm so thankful that Dr. Johnson is here with us today. Thank you for that gracious introduction, uh, Tammy. Good day, everyone. I'm pleased that the Western Gallery and the curator, Tammy Landis, have invited me to share my thoughts about a portion of Knowledge Bennett's exhibit, Road to Damascus. The show is by turns an enlightening, painful, and sobering, but always incis incisive perspective on events and personalities from nearly a century ago until contemporary times. 
His subjects span popular culture and politics, often linking the two. As a scholar and teacher in the field of race and public policy in America, I was particularly drawn to his series, Orange is the New Black. I learned something new in preparing for this talk. Reference, references to something being the new black is a phrase used in popular culture to denote some other color become trendy, but only for a period of time, uh, supplanting the classic black in fashion, um, in terms of evening wear and so forth. The recent popular Netflix comedy, which I was aware of, I knew it was popular, but I actually never watched it, was called Orange is the New Black, and it's centered around a white upper middle class woman who ends up in prison after getting caught up in the world of illegal drugs. Thus, she traded her fashionable black evening wear for an orange prison jumpsuit. Using orange and black acrylic and silk screen on canvas, Bennett plays on this phrase, looking at how it's often been trendy for American political institutions to dehumanize and often take the lives of African Americans uh, from the 1930s and 90s in ways that uh, have them ultimately in those orange prison jumpsuits. Bennett begins his odyssey with the Tuskegee syphilis experiments conducted uh, from the 1930s to the 1970s they were conducted on uh, 600 black men in Alabama, 399 of whom had syphilis. They were promised, these were unknowing sharecroppers, rural people, <clears throat> not very educated, and they were promised free health care if they participated. Drugs such as aspirin and mineral supplements were administered to the men even after penicillin had become the recommended treatment for syphilis in 1947. And of course, that was because the people needed to die so that autopsies could be, could be performed to continue, quote unquote, the study of the pathology. The experiments went on until 1972, and 128 participants died from syphilis and other ailments during that period. We see here how indifference to Black lives was fashionable. This is one of the more dramatic episodes driving African American distrust of American healthcare institutions to this day. And as we hear of the disproportionate loss of black lives with the coronavirus and stories of rumors circulating in black communities that, quote, the virus, the virus doesn't infect us, unquote, we can see the long-term negative impact that that distrust can have. Next, our attention is drawn to the impact of the FBI's ruthless counterintelligence program dubbed COINTELPRO in the 1960s and 70s. We see here J. Edgar Hoover, the notorious FBI director of the period, at the center brandishing a machine gun uh, surrounded by seemingly ominous black leaders ranging from the militant Malcolm X and Huey Newton to the Prince of Peace, Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm and Martin, of course, were both assassinated during the 1960s. Many suspect with the assistance of domestic security force, forces like the FBI. And Newton, whose Black Panthers armed themselves in the service of their communities, was wrongfully convicted for killing a policeman in 1968, a conviction that was later overturned. For all of his rhetoric, Malcolm X never lifted a hand against anyone, and Newton's Panthers who carried guns for, for self-defense against police violence, were just as renowned for their community service programs as they were for gun wielding. All three men, Martin, Malcolm, and Hewing, in differing ways were, were iconic figures in the generation's old struggle for racial justice in this country. So naturally, it was trendy to extinguish their influence and with it, the visionary leadership for the future of black people in this country. Having destroyed or marginalized African American leadership in the 1960s, the next, three, the next three pictures focus on the ways that the state engaged in campaigns spanning several decades to destroy Black communities themselves. Then it shows how President Richard Nixon's war on drugs in the 1970s was really a war on Blacks and hippies. 
the two most powerful anti-establishment movements coming out of the 1960s. We see the quote from top Nixon staffer of the time, John Ehrlichman, a guy who incidentally has Northwest uh, roots, he was from Bellevue. But John er Ehrlichman, who incidentally was commenting uh, after having done prison time for his role in the Watergate scandal, it, I can share my own experience about how the introduction of powerful new strains of marijuana and other drugs became more prominent in black communities in the 1970s and acted parallel to the impacts of COINTELPRO to undercut the potency of black nationalism of the time. Of course, the drug trade depends critically on drug dealers. The Black Panthers had made themselves vulnerable in the 1960s by valorizing convicts, many of whom had served time on drug charges. For the Panthers, that lumpen proletariat, the most downtrodden and exploited by the capitalist system, would be the vanguard of the coming Black Revolution. The Black Panthers had captured the imagination of Black youth at that time. After the political impetus of the Panthers and Black power in general had been vanquished in the 1970s, however, Black youth resorted to street gangs for a sense of camaraderie. And some have, co have commented on, of course, uh, urban street gangs have been a feature of Black urban culture uh, since the Great Migration happened in the early decades, in the middle decades of the 20th century in most of our major cities. And people have commented on how the Black Panthers, uh, uh, many, uh, uh, I mean, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, the founders were men in their 20s, but many of their recruits were very young, high school age. And so for a period, that kind of you know, enthusiasm uh, uh, for the Black liberation movement replaced uh, the more traditional uh, uh, gang culture in the 1960s and so forth. Uh, but once that was gone, uh, the gang culture came back and with it, you know, trade and illicit drugs and those kinds of things. Now, in his next piece, Bennett further develops the impact of the gang drug culture. He uses Gary Webb's explosive 1996 expose on the CIA infusion of crack cocaine into black communities and the use of the profits of sales to fund the Contra rebels in Nicaragua. For your information, the Contras were, were right-wing insurgents fighting to overthrow the revolutionary government in Nicaragua. President Reagan couldn't get Congress to fund them, so he had the CIA find this treacherous way of funding them illegally and doing great harm to Black communities at the same time. Ali North, who, was, who we see quoted on the print, uh, was a National Security Council member uh, during uh, that time under Reagan, and who was involved in the scandal, and later said, press, quote unquote, President Reagan knew everything about those illicit drug operations. The black drug kingpins, kingpins that are depicted, of course, were unknowing pawns in the conspiracy as crack cocaine ravaged urban black communities uh, in the 1980s. <clears throat> and finally, there is Bill Clinton, who as knowledge says was pandering for the black vote in 1992. Here we see him on the Arsenio Hall show, uh, the popular late night show during that time. Arsenio Hall, uh, first black um, uh, person to have a, a late night program. And we see Clinton blowing the saxophone and appearing more relatable to black audiences. But shortly thereafter, he would trash Reverend Jesse Jackson as an invited speaker at Jackson's Rainbow Coalition Conference. <clears throat> he criticized the youth panel where one rapper had said, quote, maybe if we start to shoot the police, we'll get some attention for our pro problems in our community, quote, unquote. Showing no sensitivity to the alienation of urban black youth, he scolded Reverend Jackson on stage the next day. That display, like the crime bill he signed into law in 1994 was, was for the consumption of white America. That bill accelerated the mass incarceration of African Americans, which, are, which we are still grappling with today. The barbed wire fencing shown above Clinton and Hall 
profoundly portrays the way that, like Nixon and Reagan before him, offering African Americans orange prison, orange prison apparel was in fashion for the Clinton administration. So since the 19th century, people of color in general have averaged around 40% of the U.S. prison population, although uh, they, they wouldn't have been more than about 20% of the population during uh, those early periods. From 1970 to 2007, and we'll remember that 1970 is around the time that Nixon's uh, war on drugs began, um, the U.S. prison population increased eightfold between 1970 and 2007. In 2009, that population had reached over 2 million people, the largest imprisoned population in the world. 70% of the prison population was people of color, with 45% over 900,000 being African American. This is in a country which was still around 65% white at that time. Orange is indeed the new black. Knowledge Bennett takes us through a slice of history across a period when the popular narrative sees advancements in racial justice from the Jim Crow era of legal white supremacy in the South to the early 90s when legal racial equality was the order of the day. The Tuskegee experiments could, could be conducted in so wanton a fashion when black lives mattered little. And in Alabama, they could persist until after the passage of the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. The other thing that's going on across those decades is the movement of the U.S. economy from primarily manufacturing to mainly service industries. Those Black families that migrated from the South to the Northern and Western cities for industrial jobs in the first half of the 20th century found those jobs disappearing after 1960. Black, and for that matter, not highly educated labor in general, became economically marginalized. They literally became throwaway people. The attraction of gang life in the drug trade was made more viable in a society where the economy was restructuring and public education was not meeting the demands for the new job market. When young Black men resorted to crime to survive, they became fodder for one of, one of the growing new sectors of the economy, the prison industrial complex. Orange indeed is the new black, uh, as black people are outfitted in orange jumpsuits so stylish in prison these days. We thank Knowledge Bennett for illuminating these issues in such a memorable way. What did it feel like, since our, our viewers are not able to come into the gallery to see this, when you finally got to come in and see these on display and see these historical narratives, you know, where knowledge has appropriated um, visual culture from mass media on such a large scale, because these are big, you know, what people can't see here is that these kind of overtake the scale of your body. I mean, these are much taller than us. And what does it mean to stand in front of these when they're much larger than you and they're larger than life size to see these portraits and these narratives laid out on such a grand scale? Like, what was that impact for you when you physically came in here? Like, what hit you? I don't know if you can remember back to that, but since we can't experience the in-gallery, you know, experience of these. Well, you know, of course, as an African-American, you know, we, we're, we're sequestered in the ivory tower and, uh, and also with the additional disadvantage of living in a place like Bellingham, mm -hmm. but being a student and, and a teacher on these issues. But whenever you see, you know, when you're reminded of Tuskegee, um, you know, you get really angry, you mm -hmm. know. And we know we could have talked about how in more recent times, for instance, um, uh, uh, women of color in general, Native American women, for particular reasons, when they've been in prison up, up until uh, the last decade or so, th th these women were being uh, sterilized while they were in jail um, in the state of California. Um, and bouts of that sort of thing ha have happened among Black and Latino, Latin Latinx women over, over the decades as well. And so um, the way in which, you know, um, you know indifference toward 
uh, our lives that has been exhibited by things like Tuskegee, some of the other things I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Historically, you know, you know, you, you get angry. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to be successful in mainstream academia mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis requires us to. I mean, those of us who are most successful, frankly, are people who know how to put that kind of anger aside. Mm. Um, and, and not to say, that, and maybe that's not the way, because I, I, I want to I say we put it in a place where, where it's not on the surface all the time so that we can sort of get through um, our day and our weeks and our years. Mm. Uh, but then things like this, um, you know, bring it back to the surface. And, um, and of course, I lived through uh, the Tuskegee stuff, of course, uh, went on into my lifetime. Yeah, and uh, the rest of those events I remember quite well. Um, I mean, uh, because things like marijuana are legal today, you know, it's, you don't have to hide the fact that when we were youth in those days that we used it, and 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 we remembered the potency of this new stuff that started to show up in the 1970s, and then all other kinds of drugs. Of course, it, it, again, it was not just. It, the, the, there was counterculture of the period, the hippies, and many black people were counterculture as well, was vulnerable to these kinds of new drugs because people were experimenting with drugs, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they were taken advantage of. And of course it did, uh, once, once you start doing these very powerful drugs, I mean, you may talk a good game about politics, but you're not as interested in doing anything. And so there was a direct relationship uh, there. And people have always maintained, well, hey, well, where, 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 are all the, where is all this cocaine and heroin and where does all that stuff come from? But black people don't have the wherewithal to like be importing massive amounts of it into this country. So it's got to be somebody else. And, and, you know, there's always been theories about police and, and the criminal justice people uh, being involved in that importation and um, Gary Webb's uh, expose is, is one of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, but, but it's always, uh, you know, swept under the rug. I mean, I, I could have mentioned the fact that uh, he was working for, the, I think, the San Jose Mercury uh, at the time. And the, uh, the, the bigger newspapers, the LA Times, the Washington Post, New York Times, or, you know, of course they got scooped on it and then they discredited him and said, well, it's not really, you know, true. And um, he actually, he ended up, his own newspaper um, stopped backing him up and he ended up losing his job. And he, he committed suicide sometime after the millennium, Gary Webb, that journalist. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's all kinds of uh, sidebar tragedies, of course, that happen with respect to all these things. And so, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it um, brings all of those kind of bad feelings back to the surface and you have to go someplace and, and sit with yourself and, and be reflective uh, <clears throat> and calm down so that you can, you know, move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, like you mentioned, the physicality of seeing this on the scale versus reading it in a book or like coming across it again in a in an article is much different than like being faced with it in this context of an art gallery, which maybe to some is a surprise to walk in an art gallery. Do you expect to be addressed with this type of history? And something else I was going to ask you is, you know, the, the difference there of, of seeing these histories portrayed through art from the perspective of knowledge versus, you know, in a history book, like, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for your students? Um, that you had hoped, you know, would have come in to see this, um, but maybe we'll listen to this talk. Um, yeah, what does it mean for someone to translate this through an artistic practice versus uh, academic writing? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I know this may come as a surprise to you, but I, I'm a bit of a bookish nerd, and um, I also like a good lecture, and so I've done well in the very sort of conventional classroom setting. And, you know, you teach about race and public policy and, you, and we do social scientific and academic, and we use those theories. Mm 
and, 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 and intellectual frameworks. And that, that appeals to some people because it, it could be better when academics can write in a compelling way too, and many of us don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned, uh, and, and I have a couple of colleagues uh, at the university. I mean, I had the pleasure of teaching an introduction to African-American studies at Western for several years with an English professor mm -hmm. who did, you know, black lit. And um, it was only then, and this has only been about 20 years ago, that I recognized the, the potency of, of the arts mm -hmm. as ways of transmitting knowledge. Mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, and of course that was mostly, he was teaching lit stuff. I mean, I, I, as a guy who was always involved in politics and activism, I hadn't, I hadn't even read a lot of the great African-American classics. I mean, Ellison, Richard Wright, um, and these people, James Baldwin. Um, mm -hmm. And so one became, you know, familiarized with that stuff. And, and furthermore, saw the impact that it had on the students. So I, I, I'm getting long-winded here, I'm sorry. Yeah. But art, I mean, you know, visual art the same way. Mm -hmm. um, there's some students that you could say, well, there are four ways of things to talk about with respect to the prison industrial con uh, complex. You know, you can start to give statistics and all of those kinds of things. I mean, when I talk about the transformation of the economy, I mean, there's a lot of data up there, you know, but um, seeing it depicted, yeah. um, you know, also tells the story. Mm -hmm. and, and actually what, what, what can happen, I think, is when, when you see it depicted and hopefully um, the, the, the detail that I did go into might pique someone else's interest. You know, I, I was being, I spent a lot of time on this because, you know, I ended up wanting to go back and read about the Tuskegee experiments to really sort of make sure I knew what I was talking about. Because again, when you come up in black families, you hear about them, but, 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 you know, how much in depth do you know about it? Yeah. But, but that, um, people now having looked at the exhibit said, well, what is this? Um, first of all, transformation of the economy that he's talking about that renders people as throwaway people. What, 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 what's going on there? Mm -hmm. And, um, so, so anyway, I think, I think that, you know, the arts, I mean, the humanities and the, uh, social sciences certainly go hand in hand in that respect. And there's some people who the impact is made, you know, uh, you know, better through, uh, you know, visual art, through literature, through music, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Yeah, I agree. I think I'm stuck on your word potency, right? Um, yeah. You can't really walk by this and close your eyes. You, you have to address it. You have to face it. Um, and that's, I think, kind of the goal, right? At the Western Gallery, you and I have talked about this. We want a university space that uh, brings critical conversations that you know, we're transparent. We want to be transparent about things that are not easy, that are not hard to, um, that are hard to swallow and understand. We want to push those boundaries and we want our students to see the world and to see all sides of it. And um, hearing you talk and share furthers, you know, the histories that we've been trying to demonstrate here. And it's just been a pleasure to have Bennett's work here on campus, you know, because of his work, I've been able to meet you. I've been able to meet so many other people and, you know, rally with different communities to think through what does this mean here in Bellingham? What does this mean here for our Western community? What can this take away? And I, I do think this is going to continue to um, have a ripple effect with some students. And I think having a conversation like you and I are having now as a recorded you know, presence, I think people will utilize this for years to come as like a really important moment to have this exhibition. So thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, it's, it's been such a pleasure. And I'm really, um, I'm just humbled that you took the time to share and you were so honest and honest about, you know, who you are and how this represents you and maintains parts of you and what it means and signifies. I just, I'm really thankful for your your honesty and the, the descriptions that you gave and how detailed they were. It's revealed a lot and that's exactly what, you know, we hope to do in these. So thank you for your time and your intention with this. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for giving me a little bit of a platform. Yeah, yeah.
Absolutely. Well, everybody, it's been such a pleasure. I want to just direct you to our website if you do have you know, more questions about what is the Western Gallery or more about our exhibition, Knowledge Bennett Road to Damascus, please go to our website. I'm also giving you my information here at the bottom. If you have any questions or want to chat with me directly, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, and I am so thankful you joined us today for this great program. And I hope that you all are well and safe.